Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you all very much. And uh, President McLean, thank you for that nice uh, introduction. Um, a couple of things struck me. You mentioned my doctoral paper, the study of the dogmatique of Thomas Aquinas, or study of the De Potentia of Thomas Aquinas in light of the dogmatique of Paul Tillich. And whenever that's mentioned, it's a book that was read by dozens around the world. Um, <laughs> my, um, I wrote that and it was published. And I brought it to my mother. I dedicated the book to my mother and father. So I gave it to my mother and she uh, put her little reading glasses on and, and she read the first paragraph. And you know, doctoral dissertations are characterized by you know, million dollar words and really general lack of intelligibility. And she finished one paragraph and she put her glasses down and said, oh, Bobby. And <laughs> I've always thought that was the best review of that book. So um, I'd recommend you read some of the other ones. Um, Listen, I'm delighted to be here at Thomas Aquinas College, a place I've admired from a distance for many years. Um, Thomas Aquinas means an enormous amount to me. When I was 14 years old, uh, I was at Fenwick High School outside Chicago in an afternoon religion class, and one of the young friars taught us the quinque vie of Thomas Aquinas. And it's no exaggeration to say that it changed my life. And I'm still on the path that I was placed on that day when through those texts of Thomas Aquinas, I was introduced into what I would call the, the reality of God. I mean, I was a Catholic kid growing up and going to Mass on Sunday, but those arguments awakened in me a sense of the reality of God, which has never faded, and indeed set me on the path I'm still on today. So I always admire anything to do with Thomas Aquinas, and especially this college, which I've, as I say, admired uh, for many, many years and was eager to see more to it, I've admired your um, beautiful campus. I've seen photographs of it, especially that uh, chapel. And it was a great privilege this afternoon. I, I saw it and was immediately drawn in to pray, uh, which I think is the whole point of churches and chapels. But I was very um, struck by it. And you know, this campus, it's like uh, the campus that I'm associated with now, Mundelein Seminary, which is one of the most beautiful in the country. But the, the architecture of the place is meant to reorder your heart and your mind. And so it's a great privilege for all of you to be at this place and, and for me to see it for the first time. Well, listen now, what I want to share with you tonight in this talk is um, the substantial part of a chapter from a book I just finished. Brazos Press is bringing out a series of biblical commentaries, but written not by biblical specialists so much, but by theologians. So people like um, Stanley Hauerwas, David Burrell, uh, the great Protestant systematician, um, Robert Jensen. The last book written by Avery Dulles, I saw in your uh, literature, I think it was 2005, Avery Dulles was here for your uh, graduation. The last book that Cardinal Dulles wrote was in this series. He did a commentary on 1 and 2 Timothy. So I was asked a couple years ago to work on 2 Samuel, and uh, my background is in philosophical theology. But I've always had a great love for the Bible, and it was with enormous enthusiasm that I took on this uh, challenge. Now, midway through the writing of the book, I became rector of the seminary, which, which closed the writing of the book down and, and brought it almost to a halt. But this past summer, I, I managed to finish the book. And um, what I want to read to you tonight is a substantive part of one of the chapters of the book. Um, your president reminded me at dinner that when some people saw the title, they thought, oh my gosh, a talk on liturgical dance. Uh, having lived through the era of very bad liturgical dance, trust me, I'm not talking about that. But of this great image of David dancing before the ark, which in many ways is a climactic moment in the Old Testament revelation. I hope to make that clear in the paper and also to show why it matters for us who are liturgical people, what it means for us to dance again before the ark of the Lord. Yeah, I was very struck in your chapel, of course, you have those beautiful uh, Bernini-like twisted columns. We well, you know the inspiration for that goes all the way back to the Jerusalem temple. The claim was that those twisty um, columns were in the Jerusalem temple. Every time we gather for mass, what we are doing is entering into the definitive temple. We are, as I'll try to explain, in our own liturgical gestures and movements, imitating the dance of David before the Ark of the Covenant. So what I hope you see is that this great text has a lot to say about our own spiritual lives, especially in liturgy. Okay, with that, now let me read um, a substantive part, anyway, of this uh, chapter. 
First and Second Samuel constitute one of the truly great documents that's come down to us from the ancient world. Its theological significance is obvious, but it also stands out as a literary masterpiece. Marked by narrative subtlety, rich elusiveness, chiastic structuring, and poetic beauty. Its portraits of Samuel, Saul, Joab, and especially David the king are among the most psychologically perceptive and humanly affecting in all of literature. What I want to do in this paper is to concentrate on a particularly vivid moment in the career of David, namely the king's conquest of Jerusalem and his conveyance of the Ark of the Covenant into his new capital. This episode is of considerable historical interest, of course, but it's also a hinge moment in the development of a distinctively Israelite theology of worship. As such, it functions as an anticipation of the new and definitive David, who roughly a thousand years later would give his father perfect worship in that same city of Jerusalem. So with the defeat of the Philistines, David's consolidation of kingly leadership was, from a political standpoint, more or less complete. He had emerged as the new Adam, that's to say the defender, or the leader of a properly defended Eden. But there was more to Adam than kingliness. The first man was presented by the rabbis of the intertestamental period and by the church fathers as priest as well as king. Walking in easy fellowship with Yahweh, Adam was naturally in the stance of adoration, a word derived from adoratio, ad ora, literally mouth to mouth. To adore is to be mouth to mouth with God breathing in the divine life and breathing out praise. We might see in the opening line of the Song of Songs, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, not only a cry of erotic desire, but a longing of the soul for worship. Mouth to mouth, one is also reconciled to God. Cilia, right? Concilia, eyelash to eyelash with him. So aligned, Everything in the worshiper becomes properly ordered, harmonized like the medallions of a rose window around the center. In the attitude of adoration, Adam was, accordingly, the first priest, and the ordered garden that surrounded him could be construed as the primordial temple. Right praise, literally orthodoxy in its primordial sense, leads to the right ordering of the one who gives praise and also conduces toward the right ordering of the family, the community, the society, and indeed the cosmos that surrounds him. In this context, we can understand a remark often associated with Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, the founders of the Catholic worker movement. Cult cultivates the culture. Business, finance, politics, sports, the arts, entertainment, etc all find their proper place and realize their proper finality when they are grounded in the praise of God. According to the liturgical prayer, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. One could read that not only as a word of praise, but also as a kind of formula. When glory is given to God above all things, then peace tends to break out among us. Now, original sin could be construed as the result of bad kingly leadership on the part of the first king. In light of the clarification just made, it might also be appreciated, too, as the suspension of right praise, as the consequence of a failure in priesthood. When they listened to the voice of the serpent and disobeyed the command of God, Adam and Eve fell out of the stance of adoratio, and ordered their hearts away from the unconditioned good. This led to the interior disintegration, integration, the falling apart of mind from flesh, soul from body, intention from action, etc. It also gave rise to the disintegration of community and the alienation from nature. The expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden should not be interpreted as a sentence passed by an insulted deity but rather as the inevitable consequence of bad praise. When something other than God is given glory in the highest, the garden turns into a desert. 
There's the Bible in a nutshell, if you want. Why, by the way, the, the Jesus is, is buried in a garden, planted there like a seed. Why Mary Magdalene thinks he's the gardener, the recovery of the garden, etc. We might read the entirety of the biblical narrative as the story of God's attempts to lure his people back into right praise. Not as though God needs such devotion, but precisely because such devotion is tantamount to human flourishing. When sin resulted in the destruction of the entirety of the created order, God sent, according to the biblical narrative, a rescue operation in the form of a great ship on which a microcosm of Eden could be preserved. This is why Noah must be read as a priestly figure as well, presiding over a tiny remnant where right praise was practiced. Once the flood waters had receded, Noah the priest offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and allowed the good order that he had preserved now to flood the world, constituting it as a temple. As Yahweh shaped his people Israel, he consistently coupled covenant with sacrificial worship. Thus Abram, having heard the promise that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars, was asked to sacrifice five animals to the Lord, cutting their bodies in two. Moses received the word of Yahweh on Sinai and then slaughtered bulls and sprinkled their blood on the altar and on the people. In Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, we hear detailed prescriptions governing the offering of sacrifice to the Lord, oblations that took place in a tabernacle or tent sanctuary accompanying the wandering people in the desert. Why would the worship that Yahweh demands be sacrificial in form? Well, prior to the fall, adoration would have been effortless. But after the tumble into sin, right praise comes only at a cost. This is because heterodoxy, bad praise, had twisted the human person out of shape, setting, as we saw, mind against will, body against spirit, passion against passion, etc. To recover one's spiritual equilibrium, therefore, was necessarily painful. When someone brought an animal to the tabernacle, later to the temple, for sacrifice, he was saying implicitly that what was happening to that animal should by rights be happening to him, the offerer of the sacrifice. Now, at the heart of the tabernacle, of course, was the Ark of the Covenant the gold-plated box of acacia wood, which housed the remnants of the tablets of the law, the rod of Aaron, and some pieces of manna, all reminders of the Exodus journey and the Sinai covenant. This ark became the focus of Israelite worship, both a sign of Yahweh's presence among his people and a pledge of the people's obedience. Like Noah's ark, it was a microcosm of Eden, creation rightly ordered around the praise of God. And this is precisely why the ark was carried by Israel into battle. In the book of Numbers we hear, listen, whenever the ark set out, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered and your foes flee, flee before you. The task of the kingly and priestly people of Israel was to Edenize the world. And hence they would carry this emblem of Eden before them when they met the enemies of Yahweh. One of the central tragedies of Israelite history is described in 1 Samuel, the loss of the ark during a disastrous battle with the Philistines. Quote, so the Philistines fought, Israel was defeated and they fled, everyone to his home. There was a great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. This represents a colossal failure of the kingly and priestly mission of Israel, the collective Adam. But in the somewhat comical section of 1 Samuel known as the Ark narrative, we see that the power of the true God is greater than that of the false gods that can beguile the human heart. When the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the house of Dagon, that means a shrine to the God of the Philistines, the idols collapse before it. Quote, but when they rose early on the next morning, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. There's much more here than an affirmation that one particular ancient Middle Eastern god is more powerful than another. 
It's a showing forth of this absolutely central theme that human flourishing is the consequence of right praise. The central battle of Israel's God is always against idolatry, for everything that is dysfunctional in the human heart and in society flows finally from that primordial skewing. In this regard, the story of the ark's triumph over Dagon is not unlike the account in 1 Kings of Elijah's victory over the priests of Baal. Now, this brief summary provides, however inadequately, a background for the decisively important sixth chapter of 2 Samuel. Having become king, David knows he must become a priest, for he is to preside over a liturgical kingdom. In the book of Exodus, we hear that Yahweh would form an orthodox nation, a people who worship aright. Quote, Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. That's Exodus 19, 5 through 6. The prescriptions given to Moses and the sons of Aaron, as well as the mobile tabernacle with the ark, were the provisional means by which Yahweh was shaping this priestly people during the years of wandering and during the period of consolidation. But David intuited that these strands had to be gathered and that above all, the ark had to come to rest in his new capital city, providing thereby an unambiguous center for the nation, a still point around which all of its various elements could arrange themselves. And this is why David's establishment of the ark in Jerusalem represents a certain climax to the narrative that began with the fall, led through the formation of the priestly people, the cutting of covenants, the giving of the law, and the invasion of the promised land. Chapter 6 commences on a triumphant note, quote, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. The king chose a veritable army of his best men in order to seize an apparently undef undefended piece of sacred furniture and to bring it back to Jerusalem. What we're meant to see here is the enormous importance that David attaches to this mission. And as Robert Polzin, he's one of the great contemporary commentators on the Samuel literature, as Polzin astutely remarks, we're also meant to hear an echo of the 30,000 who were lost when the ark was taken by the Philistines. Baal Judah, or Bala in Judah, is a synonym for Kiriath Yeraim, mentioned in 1 Samuel 7, and beautifully evoked in the 132nd Psalm. Quote, he, David, swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord. We heard of it. We heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Yeraim. It's that beautiful lyrical passage from Psalm 132. This passage captures so well the holy obsession of David to ground and center his liturgical empire through right praise. In the account of this scene in 1 Chronicles, we hear that David consulted with the entire people before making this move and that they enthusiastically supported him. Hence, we see the liturgical people gladly shaping themselves around the ark and around the priest king. The ark of the covenant, we are told, was in the house of Abinadab, an Israelite who presumably took it in when it was returned by the Philistines many years before, when they were convinced that it bore a curse. Abinadab's dwelling is said to be, quote, on the hill, which probably carries the implication of a holy place or shrine of some kind. What's of interest is why, during the long years of Saul's reign and the Civil War, the ark had been more or less forgotten. Was this perhaps emblematic of the fact that suspension of right worship and the dissolution of Israel always go hand in hand? Once he found the ark, David endeavored to bring it back. He placed it in a new cart, 
which is to say a cart which had never been used before for any secular purpose, and he commenced the journey back to Jerusalem. We hear that Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were directing the cart, and that David and his entourage were dancing with reckless abandon before the Ark of the Lord. When the festive liturgical procession reached the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and the Ark was jostled, so that Uzzah, innocently enough, reached out to steady it, at which point he was struck dead by an angry god. Now, there's probably no story in 2 Samuel that puzzles and irritates a contemporary reader more than this one. To conceive of God's ark as the bearer of a deadly electric charge and to conceive of God as a cruel tyrant capable of an utterly disproportionate reaction to a minor and unintentional liturgical infraction seems at best primitive and at worst dangerous. Much of the liberal enlightened theologizing of the last 200 years, in fact, militates against this sort of construal of God's relationship with humanity. The problem for liberal theology, of course, is that this story in 2 Samuel is hardly egregious. The Bible is filled with accounts of God's anger, God's justice, and God's punishment. And often enough, the biblical authors present a divine retribution, which appears, at least to us, to be disproportionate or exaggerated. What sense can we make of this? The one who created the whole cosmos, the heavens and the earth in more scriptural terminology, cannot be determined by any of the limitations or ontological conditions that circumscribe creatures. The one who gives the entirety of the being of the world cannot, for example, be characterized as standing in need of any further existential realization. This in turn entails the immutability of the creator. Now it's crucially important to note this hasn't a thing to do with God being cold or indifferent to the world that he's made. God's immutability means that God cannot change in a creaturely way, which is to say in the manner of finite being moving beyond its limits toward greater perfection of being. From God's unchangeability, we can deduce that God does not pass in and out of emotional states, shifting as we do from contentment to discontentment, from joy to anger, from anticipation to disappointment, etc. As the author of 1 John clarifies, God simply is love, implying that the very to be of God is identical with the stance and attitude of love. Mutable as we are, we creatures fall in and out of love. We love to varying degrees. We love and then we don't love. But this can't be the case in regard to the God who stands beyond the ontological vagaries of the created realm. But how does this divine love manifest itself? To answer that question adequately, we have to be clear on what love is. For the mainstream of the theological and spiritual tradition, love is not an emotion or sentiment. Rather, it is the act of willing the good of the other as other. But this means that love will express itself in a variety of ways, depending upon the object of love. If I love someone who's on a self-destructive path, my willing of his good will undoubtedly appear as harsh angry, even punitive, for I'm trying to get that person rightly aligned. Therefore, God's anger might be construed, and indeed the tradition does so just this way, as a symbolic expression of God's passion to set things right, as the dark face, if you want, of his love. We might think of God's love as a, as a pure light, which upon passing through the prism of creation and history breaks into a variety of colors. The language of the biblical authors, drawn as it must be from psychology and general experience, gestures analogically toward the various ways that the one divine love manifests itself in the world. Storytellers tend to express themselves in bold and exaggerated manner, and the biblical narr narrators are no exception. To give just two examples, think of the ages of the patriarchs, or the number of warriors mustered for or killed in battle. Thus. When they want to gesture toward the divine passion to set things right, they'll often present a God raging in anger or burning with indignation or even putting thousands to death. We should not literalize this language either historically or psychologically. Instead, we should construe it as a poetic indication of the dark face of a love which remains essentially mysterious to us. 
Now, with those clarifications in mind, let's return to this particular story of Uzzah and the Ark of the Covenant. Why would Yahweh be angry at Uzzah's attempt to prevent the sacred Ark from falling to the ground? The key issue seems to be liturgical impropriety. In Exodus 25, we hear of God's explicit instruction regarding the construction of the Ark. Quote, You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark by which to carry the ark. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. Exodus chapter 25, verse 13. God wanted the ark design in a very particular way, and he ordained that it be carried in a particular way. The principal problem with David's first attempt to carry the ark into his capital city is that he was hauling it by cart rather than carrying it by the poles. It was this faster but more precarious form of transport that caused the ark to tip and Uzzah to react. Now, once more, we're sorely tempted to conclude that a god who'd respond with deadly violence to such a minor violation of liturgical law is surely unbalanced. Yet we have to keep in mind the symbolic nature of the language and get to the spiritual truths the author is endeavoring to communicate. The entire purpose of the liturgy, as we've seen, is to restore humanity to right order, adoratio leading to the harmonizing of self and society. Over the course of many centuries, Yahweh had been forming his people in the ways of orthodoxy. And at the heart of this right praise is a decentering of the self, a twisting away from the ego and a turning toward God. As we saw, the founder of Israel, Abraham, was a man who listened to God and the whole of Israelite life, covenant, worship, prophecy, etc., was a systematic attempt to help the people to attend to the Lord. So the famous Shema prayer, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. It was indeed more convenient to carry the ark by means of an ox cart, but the Lord had instructed that it be carried by poles. A small matter, perhaps, but obedience is the hinge on which Israelite life turns. God was angry not because Uzzah's act personally offended him. In point of fact, the one who needs nothing from the world cannot even in principle be offended, but rather because it represented a compromising of the liturgical attitude. The church fathers, by the way, were eminently clear on this score. Here's John Chrysostom commenting on this, quote, as the wrath of God was drawn down on Uzzah for intruding on an office that was not his own, God's wrath will likewise advance against those who subvert the gospel. Here's Salvian's remark on the same scene, quote, Uzzah's punishment for steadying the ark shows that nothing may be considered lightly when it appertains to God. Here's Patient of Barcelona, quote, so great a concern was there of reverence toward God that God did not accept bold hands even when they were trying to help." Close quote. Another theological theme that emerges from this odd tale, which I think is worthy of some careful consideration, is that of the divine inscrutability and sublimity. The creator of the universe cannot, as we saw, be categorized in any conventional philosophical system. God cannot be deftly defined or set in easy contrast to other beings or states of affairs. Thomas Aquinas catches the sheer strangeness of God when he comments that God is not in any genus, even the genus of being. Further, the providential range of God includes the whole of creation, which means the totality of space and time. And all of this implies that God's activities and purposes in the world will necessarily remain inscrutable to a finite mind. Hence Paul in Romans, oh the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. The strangeness of God and his actions has nothing to do with capriciousness on God's part, but is rather a function of God's absolutely unique manner of being and our limited consciousness. The author of the book of Job, of course, makes much the same point in his magnificently constructed dialogue between a frustrated human sufferer and the providential Lord of the entire cosmos. We might utilize a Kantian conceptual framework here and speak of the sublimity of God. 
which is to say God's overwhelming of the human sensorium and intellect. Hans Urs von Boltzer spoke of God as a raging alpine torrent which utterly smashes any receptors designed to channel it and convert it to human use. The divine sublimity is by turns thrilling and terrifying. The prophet Isaiah can exult in the overwhelming beauty of God manifested in a temple vision of cloud and angels. But as the letter of the Hebrew ha Hebrews has it, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A one-sided stress on the latter quality gives us an arbitrary God, but a unilateral stress on the former gives us a superficial and manipulable God. Without for a moment rescinding any of the clarifications made above, I would also simply say this. Yahweh striking down Uzzah is finally inexplicable, for it expresses and participates in the sublimity of God. The sheer weirdness of God's act would help to explain why David was angry. I'm quoting now. David was angry because the Lord had burst forth with an outburst upon Uzzah. Robert Alter, another great contemporary commentator here, renders the Hebrew here as afraid of the Lord. And the ambivalence is eloquent, for both anger and fear would indeed be understandable reactions to the disorienting sublimity of God. To be sure, in a pastoral context, the Christian minister discovers that anger at and fear of God are very common states of soul among those who are striving to believe in God. On account of this anger and fear, David resolved not to bring the ark into his capital and instead had it sent to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, most likely a Philistine from Gath who had attached himself to David during the time when David was a vassal of the king of Gath. In the earlier sections of the ark narrative, the presence of the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of the Philistines had caused the foreign gods to fall. Now, however, while the sacred vessel resides in the house of a Philistine within Israel, quote, the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Is there a foreshadowing here of the ingathering of the nations, a hint of the blessings that would come to the peoples of the world when they had ordered themselves to the right praise of God? Inspired by this benediction of Obed-Edom's house, David endeavored anew to bring the ark into its proper house in Jerusalem. What ensued was one of the richest and most festive liturgical processions described in the Bible. The king was careful not to make the same mistake he'd made before, hauling the ark by ox cart. This time he arranged for bearers to carry the ark by poles set through rings, exactly as Exodus had specified. Further, he ordered that when the bearers had taken but six steps, they sacrificed an ox and a fatling. There's some ambiguity here. Does the author mean to insinuate that the procession stopped every six paces to sacrifice, or simply that it, they did so at the beginning of the march? If the former were true, the parade would have been endless, and Israel would have been emptied of oxen pretty quickly. <laughs> but in either case, the point is made that the ark is conduced in a festive but sacrificial attitude the people aware both of their blessing and of their sin. In the killing of the animals, we see an anticipation of the thousands upon thousands of sacrifices that would take place over the centuries in the Jerusalem temple. Though the practice is utterly alien to us, the logic of sacrifice is actually quite straightforward. One returns to God some aspect of creation in order to signal one's gratitude for the whole of creation or for a blessing received or in reparation for sins committed. As I've said now many times, the creator of the universe cannot possibly need anything in the universe, but the offer of the sacrifice needs the act of sacrifice in order to become rightly ordered to God. Further, sacrifices involve the death of an animal so that the inner pain of this reorientation might be adequately symbolized. This great sacrificial procession evocative of the entire sacrificial history and attitude of Israel was presided over by the one who is not only king, but priest. The priesthood of David is unmistakably referenced too in the garb that the king dons for the parade. Quote, he was girded with a linen ephod. In the description of the priestly vestments worn by Aaron and his sons, 
the ephod is mentioned a number of times. In Leviticus, we hear that Moses, quote, brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them in water. He put the tunic on them, fastened the, fastened the sash around them, clothed them with the robe, and put the ephod on them. Most tellingly for our purposes, Saul, having invaded the sanctuary of Nob in search of David, ordered, <laughs> sorry about it, it sounds like Star Wars, I know, with these names, ordered Doeg the Edomite to kill the priests. And we're told, quote, on that day he killed 85 who wore the linen ephod. So it's the priestly garment. Quite clearly, David had decided in putting on the garment of the priesthood to assume the role and take up the task of these fallen victims of Saul. He was also hearkening back to Samuel, Eli, and the Aaronic priesthood, as well as the priesthood of Adam, the first one to assume the stance of adoratio. Only in light of the connection to Adam can we fully understand the energetic dance of the king before the ark of the Lord. Now, if you keep in score, this is kind of the, the central point I'm trying to make in this whole paper. Before the fall, Adam walked in easy fellowship with Yahweh, thinking his thoughts, feeling his feelings, moving as he moved. He danced, if you want, in unison with the Lord. Sin is nothing but a falling out of step with God, an insistence upon dancing to one's own rhythm. The whole of the history of salvation might be characterized as Yahweh's attempt to restore the sacred dance, to get his human creatures to move with him. Accordingly, David, dancing with energy before the ark, is humanity dancing with the Lord, recovering the effortless harmony of Eden. It's been argued that the gestures and movements of the priests in the Jerusalem temple were intended to mimic in a stylized way this exuberant dance of King David. And since the ritual moves of the Byzantine and Catholic mass trace their origins to temple worship, we could conclude that the processions, gestures, and bows of Christian priests today participate in the priesthood of the king who wore the ephod as he danced before the ark. I'd wager there's still another element of the story that makes it puzzling for most moderns, namely why David and his people would be dancing before the law. As we saw, the ark contained manna and the staff of Aaron, but it contained most importantly the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the rather strict provisions and prohibitions given by Yahweh to Moses on Sinai. Most reasonable people in the West today would accept the law, from traffic regulations to required income tax, as a necessary evil, something that in the best of all possible worlds they would do without. Therefore, it'd be difficult indeed to imagine anyone dancing with joy before the tax code or the latest prescriptions determined by a county board or even before the Constitution, as much as we admire it. To understand the coherence of David's dance, we have to grasp the sea change that occurred from biblical to modern times in regard both to law and to freedom. On the modern reading, freedom is primarily choice and self-determination. The roots of this view stretch back to the late medieval period to the speculations of William of Ockham. For the English Franciscan, human freedom is utterly autonomous, for it's the capacity to choose on the basis of no constraint, either interior or exterior. The sheer independence of the will, he argued, is proved by an act of suicide committed by a sincere religious believer, for such a move against the supreme good is made in the presence of the supreme good. The contemporary Thomas, Servet Pinkers, refers to this Occamus notion as, quote, the freedom of indifference. For it's predicated on the assumption that the free agent hovers indif indifferently above the yes and the no. An implication of this way of construing freedom is that each moral act is monadic, something like a Whiteheadian actual occasion. Precisely because the truly free choice can be determined by nothing whatsoever, neither the character of the agent nor the succession of his previous moral moves can have a determining influence on his present ethical choice. On this interpretation, law must be seen as a limitation on freedom, and hence as, at best, a necessary evil. Freedom perforce will chafe against the law 
and law by its very nature will set limits to unruly freedom. Moreover, when Occam extrapolates theologically from this construal of freedom, he arrives at an understanding of God as supremely arbitrary power. And since the divine freedom is as unconstrained in its essence as human freedom, infinite and finite liberty will necessarily confront one another as opponents, and their relationship will be mediated only by a divine law powerfully imposed. Welcome to much of the controversy, by the way, in atheists both old and new. Many have argued that this account of the God-human relationship conduced by a few short logical steps to atheism. For such a God will inevitably be seen as a threat to human flourishing. Hence Feuerbach will conclude that the no to God is the yes to man. And Sartre would formulate the pithy syllogism, if God exists, I can't be free. But I am free, therefore God does not exist. See, all that comes from this, I would say, weird construal of freedom. But prior to Occam, there was a very different notion of freedom, what Pink Harris has called liberté de qualité, freedom for excellence, we would say. Here, freedom is not primarily choice and self-creation, but the disciplining of desire in order to make the achievement of the good first possible and then effortless. One becomes a free player of the violin that's to say, capable of playing any type of music on it, precisely in the measure that one submits to a range of disciplines, laws, and practices. Or one becomes a free swinger of the golf club, able to respond effortlessly to the shifting demands of the game, inasmuch as one has internalized the laws and rules that govern good swinging. On this interpretation, Law is not the enemy of freedom, but rather the condition for its possibility. And that, a whole range of cultural uh, shifts hinge. A most important concomitant of this notion is a view articulated in the philosophical anthropology of Thomas Aquinas, namely that will is a function of intellect. For Aquinas, the will emerges at the moment when the mind understands the good as good. And this entails that the objective good never stands over and against freedom as a constraint, but rather informs and guides it at every turn. And the theological implications are significantly non occamist here. God is free not inasmuch as he stands in sovereign indifference to the yes and the no, but inasmuch as he can only say yes in the measure that his will is utterly congruent with the goodness of his being. Read Aquinas on whether God can sin and you'll see this whole question uh, displayed. God and freedom so construed, the divine will is not a threat to human flourishing, just the contrary. And hence the sacred law is indeed something in the presence of which a grateful humanity might be tempted to dance. Now, I'm gonna, I wanna make a couple final uh, observations before turning from David's dance. A connection that the fathers of the church made with particular enthusiasm was between the Ark of the Covenant, which bore the divine law, and Mary of Nazareth, who bore the divine presence in the fullest possible sense. Hence, Maximus of Turin says, quote, but what would we say the Ark was if not Holy Mary, since the Ark carried within it the tables of the covenant, while Mary bore the master of that same covenant? One of the many artistic depictions of this patristic association is the relief of a juxtaposed Mary and the Ark, which is carved in stone over the left portal at Notre Dame in Paris. A number of symbolic echoes can now be heard. David arose and went to get the Ark, as we saw, which was in the house of Abinadab, situated on a hill, probably a shrine, in the hill country of Judah. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told, just after the Annunciation, quote, that Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. In other words, the supreme ark, like its prototype, situates itself on a hilltop shrine in Judea. I don't say shrine casually here, for Zechariah is a temple priest and Elizabeth a descendant of Aaron, the first priest. 
Further, after the death of Uzzah, David said, quote, How can the ark of the Lord come into my care? That's 2 Samuel 6, 9. And upon receiving her cousin, Elizabeth said, quote, And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? Luke 1, 43. Both David and Elizabeth feel unworthy to be in the presence of the bearer of the Lord. The king danced with all his might before the ark, and, quote, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. Luke 1, 41. The unborn John the Baptist performing an infant's dance in the presence of the true ark. Finally, an intriguing detail. After the Uzzah incident, David sent the ark, as we saw, to the home of Obed-Edom, where it stayed for three months. After delivering her great Magnificat, quote, Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and returned to her home, Luke 1, 56. There can be little doubt that Luke is consciously echoing these stories of the ark in order to highlight Mary's identity as Theotokos. Just the last couple of remarks. Having described the king's procession into Jerusalem, the narrator lingers over David's performance of a variety of kingly and priestly tasks. First, he established the ark in its tent or tabernacle within the holy city, thus anticipating the eventual installation of the ark in a proper temple by his son Solomon. Next, he offered up burnt offerings and offerings of well-being, two prototypes of what would become temple sacrifice. And finally, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Going into the ark, offering sacrifice, and then returning to bless the assembled crowd, David is anticipating the moves of the high priest on the Day of Atonement, reconciling Yahweh and Israel and establishing a new Garden of Eden. Finally, David performed a distinct, distinctively kingly act feeding, quote, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. That's 2 Samuel 6, 19. Here he is Moses, who promised to give the people food and drink during their sojourn in the desert. He's Joshua, who pledged to bring Israel to a land flowing with milk and honey. And he is Adam, sharing the fruitfulness of the garden. The ark, which was constructed in the shadow of Sinai, has finally found a resting place, and Jerusalem is thereby established as the center of Israelite worship, the still point around which the whole nation could turn. Thank you all for listening tonight. Thanks.